Chapter 5, The Working Cell, Part 1. When you look at how our cells work, one of the places to start is their energy requirements. And energy is hugely important in our cells, and it's not altogether obvious where this energy might come from. After all, at night, you don't have to plug yourselves in and somehow recharge. So as a consequence, what these next couple of chapters are doing is to help us understand how our body gets energy. And let's just take a look at energy and figure out what that means and by what mechanisms in nature energy is governed. So this first part here simply explains a little bit about the laws of nature, the, the laws of physics that underlie all energy processes. First up, energy is defined as the capacity to do work. The capacity to do work is a definition from physics. And when it comes to work in this regard, it does not mean that you work in construction or you work in legal or you work in something in particular as in a job. This is the definition from physics for work. And work in this sense simply means moving something against an opposing force. So as you move your pen on the paper, you're moving something against an opposing force. There is friction between the tip of the pen and the paper. And so work is being done. In addition, as you move that pen, your muscles are going to move against the force of gravity, against the force of friction within your muscles. And so again, work is being done. You may be surprised how many different areas of the body and of that pen are impacted by the work that needs to be done just to write something down. For us, of course, the broader picture is to figure out how it works for the entire organism. So we're not just looking at energy from a specific perspective in terms of the task that you're about to perform. But we're looking at what energy is needed to just maintain our body before we even get going with some actual activity. It turns out we all require energy to stay alive. And one of the questions, obviously, is where exactly that energy comes from. This is one of the reasons why we needed to look a little bit at the biochemistry of things earlier on, because it turns out that a lot of this energy business links back to some of the chemical reactions and all the different things that go with those reactions. So if you want to grow as an organism, energy is needed. If you want to move as an organism, energy is needed. In fact, the use of energy is one of the characteristics of organisms. Now when we look at energy, energy will primarily come in two different types. The first of these is the energy of motion, and the energy of motion is called kinetic energy. You may have heard of the term kinesiologist. A kinesiologist is somebody who helps you regain motion in, in your limbs, perhaps. And so kinesis is motion, and kinetic energy is the energy of motion. In this image, it's the cyclist who is working very hard to get himself up the trail to the top of the hill. Once the cyclist reaches the top of the hill, there is a certain potential in that cyclist. He has now worked hard enough to get to the top of the hill, and we all know once you kick off from the top of the hill, you can run all the way down the hill without actually exerting any more energy. That bicycle is simply just going to roll down the hill. And that's because on top of the hill, you have stored energy. And that stored energy is called potential energy. Clearly, when you have stored energy, a variety of things are possible. In this case, you can move down the hill. If it's a, a, a ball, you can make it roll down the hill. So there are various ways by which you can use stored energy. And it turns out that between those two, there is an interplay 
in terms of energy, just as the individual who is biking up the trail is probably at some point going back down the trail. So there's an interplay of that activity just as there is an interplay between these different types of energies. Now, when you look at how these two types of energy interact, you'll realize very quickly that there is actually an energy cycle at work. And this energy cycle allows the energy to go from some type of energy of movement, that would be some type of kinetic energy, to some type of potential energy, and back and forth and back and forth. In this case, you'll see that there is a diving board, and if somebody climbs up the diving board, what they're doing is basically the same as what the cyclist was doing. They're using some of their energy in the body, they're doing work, because what they're doing is they're going against the force of gravity. And so as they move up, they're expending some kinetic energy. Their muscles are needing to work to get them up there. Once they reach the top, they can stand there and not use any additional energy to just stand there. They don't have to move but it gives them the opportunity now to dive off. So at the top of the diving platform, somebody will have a certain amount of potential energy. They can do something with this energy. Well, what most people do, of course, is they jump off. And in the jumping off, you're converting some of this potential energy to kinetic energy of movement. So now that potential energy you have up on top is being used to get you back down. And you don't have to do any work for that. You simply jump down because gravity will pull you. And of course, once you reach the bottom again, your potential energy is at a minimum and you can't really do anything at the bottom of this. You're going to have to get out of the water and that takes work again. And this work will be moving out of the water. And so that's kinetic energy again. And so there is this consistent cycling between these two types of energy. And we'll see how this works at the biochemical level as well. In order to allow our body to obtain energy, we're going to have to convert energy. You probably all know this intuitively. If you feel as if you're low of energy, whatever that means to you, you say, oh, I better have a snack. Or perhaps I'm going to need some kind of a drink. Maybe I need some sugary kind of a drink to, you know, put me back to a higher energy state. And so your body is telling you that you need to pick up some more energy and you say, okay, well, I'll get it from food. And so food is what we're going to put in to our bodies. And then the energy that's in food now needs to be converted to energy that's directly useful for our cells. Clearly, if you have a small cell and our cells are very small, you're not going to simply throw a sandwich at that cell because what's it going to do with that, right? You need to get through a variety of steps in order for you to produce energy that can be delivered to a very small cell. Energy is governed by some of the laws of physics and these are the laws of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics states some very fundamental things about energy. It states that energy can be changed from one form into another. And when we talked about kinetic energy and potential energy a minute ago, that's what we were doing. So the conversion between energy of motion and energy of uh, staying, of standing, that kind of energy is governed by the first law of thermodynamics. The second thing, which is really rather interesting and perhaps unexpected, is that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but only converted. Now, this is a tricky one. This is not something that, that people really have a deeper understanding of, and it's something that I could gloss over and not worry about, but if you think about that for a minute, if energy cannot be created or destroyed, 
then there are two questions that a scientist might ask right away. A, where did it come from? And B, where is it going? Right? That's, those are some clear questions that you might have to ask. So if you can't create energy, where ultimately does it come from? And you might have to follow the energy back to where it came from that we can see. And so in our case, that means we're looking at the energy in our body. Where did it come from? It came from food. The energy in the food, where did that come from? It came from plants. The energy in the plants, where did that come from? It came from the sun. The energy in the sun, where does that come from? Hmm. And this is how it goes. So we have another one of these conundrums. Just as we had a problem with, you know, where do cells come from? Now we have a problem with where does energy come from. Secondly, energy cannot be destroyed. So your cell is using energy, and where does it go then? It's not using it up, it's using it, and in so doing, it's converting it to something else. Primarily, it's going to be converted to heat. And as you are taking your exam, this room heats up, baby. It really does. <laughs> That's because there is a lot of heat being generated by people who are using a lot of energy and converting a lot of energy to get those brain cells going. And then what? And then where does it go? Well, it goes to the room. And then maybe out of the building. And then who knows where it goes? So that's another one of those problem areas. So even though we are going to focus on energy in a smaller area, meaning our bodies and our food, there are some fundamental problems that are very difficult to address just by looking at this first law of thermodynamics. So this explanation is not the, the all out on energy, but it's something that we're going to table for later. Now here's an example for how energy is converted. There is a person putting A, gas in the tank, and B, a drink in her body. In both cases, the drink and the gasoline have potential energy in the form of chemical energy. In fact, the chemical energy is stored in the bonds, the covalent bonds of the gasoline and of the drink. These covalent bonds are created by the movement of electrons. Movement. Ah, kinetic energy. And so as those things are moving, those electrons are moving around these atoms, that's what allows us to harvest a little bit of energy from them. And this is the process that we're going to investigate in Chapter 6. There's also a second law of thermodynamics. And the second law of thermodynamics states that energy changes are never 100% efficient. We are able to convert energy from one type to another, but as we do, some of the energy is always going to be lost to the environment. Energy changes are never 100% efficient. And this energy conversion that creates energetic disorder, that's entropy, this is one of the fundamental uh, characteristics of energy. Energy is never perfectly conserved. And so there's always friction, and some of the energy is going to be lost as perhaps sound energy or perhaps as heat energy. So when I throw something to the table, you could hear the clatter. Well, what is that good for? It's not good for anything. It's just energy as sound that dissipates. Nobody can pick that up and use it. At the same point, there was a little bit of friction between the pen and the air. And as a consequence, some energy is also lost, lost to the system. So that pen had a certain amount of potential energy in my hand. Then I threw it down, and I converted some of that energy to kinetic energy. But some of that was ultimately lost as heat and as sound. So energy 
conversions are never quite efficient. Some energy is always lost. And of course, depending on how old your vehicle is, there's more energy lost or less energy lost. Now let's talk for just one minute about the process of energy conversion, because that is ultimately what we're going to investigate. Energy conversion in automobiles is a good analogy for what happens in our cells. You start out with some type of fuel. In the case of automobiles, we use gasoline. And of course, gasoline is composed of hydrocarbons. There is a hydrogen and there is a carbon. And that's all you have. But in the presence of oxygen, that's what this is, we are able to break down the gasoline. And we do this in a container called the combustion engine. As we do so, heat energy is given off, but some of that energy is allowing your car to move. So the reaction in your vehicle is going to allow you to create a certain amount of kinetic energy for moving those wheels. And then you end up with exhaust. In the purest sense, the exhaust consists only of carbon dioxide and water. Now, why can I say this? Well, if over here we have oxygen and we have hydrogen and we have carbon, then that's really all we can have as output over here. Oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen, right? Of course, we know our exhaust doesn't include only that. And the reason for this is that there are a variety of mechanical contraptions involved in this combustion process. There are pistons that move, there are rubber gaskets, there are tires, there's all kinds of stuff that moves in addition to the car. And as a consequence of this, our exhaust has a variety of, a variety of other things, uh, not just the, the pure waste that would expect by breaking down the hydrocarbons, but also some other waste that is gathered along the way. So that's how it works in automobiles. Now, in our cells, the process is essentially the same. There are a couple of subtle differences. First of all, we don't have a combustion engine. We don't have things combust in our cells, whereas in the car, you literally blow something up. In our cells, you don't. In our cells, we tease it apart, and that's called cellular respiration. In cellular respiration, we also don't use hydrocarbons. We instead use carbohydrates. And so here you see we have oxygen in addition to the hydrogen and in addition to the carbon. So we have a little bit more in terms of uh, a molecule, a molecular choice. We also break things down in the presence of oxygen. During cellular respiration, heat energy is also lost. And the type of energy we produce is actually in the shape of a molecule. This is the kind of molecule that's going to allow us to feed ourselves with energy. So it's analogous to the kinetic energy that's used in driving your car's tires forward. <coughs> but it's a simple chemical that allows us to drive ourselves. With us, the output is pretty much carbon dioxide and water. And of course you know this because as you breathe against a mirror, there is a layer, a fine layer of mist that forms on that layer and that shows you what our exhaust is made of. So this analogy is something that you might want to remember. If you sometimes think about how our body works, it operates in a similar fashion to the combustion engine, except that we have the, the means to do it much more carefully than our car does. One way by which we differ from our cars is what we eat. We eat food and as a consequence we're going to have to eat the kinds of foods that give, uh, give us the energy we need. And as we consider the food we eat we need to be able to take in a certain number of calories. Now most of us when we talk about our diet perhaps, or uh, we, we're concerned about weight or anything like that, we count calories perhaps. And as we do so, we end up adding a variety of numbers together and we don't necessarily know what these numbers are. 
Now, the calorie itself is actually a unit of energy, and this is defined in physics as the amount of energy that raises the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Now, both of these are units, metric units, grams and Celsius. And if you do this very carefully, you do these measurements very carefully, you realize that to get to this change, that's really not a very large amount of energy. And yet, we consume a large number of calories to do this. And that's because when we look at food labels, we're actually looking at kilo calories and kilocalories are converted like this one kilocalorie which we may also call a food calorie is actually 1000 calories so a kilocalorie which is what we call a food calorie is actually 1000 calories so when you're go consuming a bean burrito and the bean burrito has 358 food calories, that's actually 358,000 calories. 350. Now, obviously, people don't like to take in thousands of anything, right? It just seems so much. So, what well, people said, well, let's just cross out the zeros. That'll look better for people. And let's just call those food calories. So there is a difference. Now he, here are some common foods, things like peanuts and apples and so on. And when you go down this list, you realize that some of the things that are m more heavily processed and perhaps have uh, more fat in them, they all, also tend to be the ones that have the higher number of calories because they are more dense in those kind of things that give you energy, more dense in carbohydrates, more dense in lipids. If you are going to work off these calories, one of the ways to try and figure out how much energy you need is to try and see what your activity might be on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's take the energy in a can of a soft drink that has 170 food calories. Remember, that's 170,000 calories. And as a consequence, what can you do with 170 calories? Well, here it says, you can bicycle slowly for an hour, and that takes care of 170 calories. So some of you may say, well, wow, if I take in you know, a certain number of calories and I drink a couple of soft drinks, it's going to take me two hours, three hours of bicycling to, to work it all off. Well, fortunately, your body, just by itself, needs a certain number of calories just to keep going. So maintenance, body maintenance already takes a huge number of calories. And then the added activity, the added activity then can take more calories off. And so if you're somebody who has a very active lifestyle, then obviously you need to eat more. But cycling leisurely for an hour, that's certainly one of the things you could do, and it's never a mistake to get some of that activity. One of the things I want to point out to you in this regard is what to do about energy drinks. Energy drinks have uh, been sort of a, a rage for some time now. And one of the things people don't realize is how much energy actually is in a can of energy drink. Clearly, you drink it because you want to boost. And because you know or you've already learned that carbohydrates, simple sugars especially, can give you that boost these types of drinks tend to be fortified with a relatively large amount of sugar. 20 grams per can is not so unusual. Now, 20 grams per can, let's put that in perspective, when you go to the restaurant and you get one of those little bags of sugar, right, that's about 3 grams. Now, look at your little energy drink and ask yourself, when I drink coffee at the restaurant, do I ever put seven bags of sugar in there? Now, there may be some people who do that, but I, I'd say most don't. Because if you do that, you don't end up with an honest cup of coffee. You end up with a sludge of coffee. Because you get to the point where the sugar actually doesn't dissolve anymore. And one of the reasons why energy drinks have 
a huge number of chemicals in them in addition to just the sugar and the water is because they want to make sure that that sugar stays in solution because right you shake it up and then there better not be any sugar bits floating around so clearly this is going to deliver in a liquid form a huge amount of sugar and it will go to your body and your body is going to recognize the sugar and your body is normally going to be able to deal with that sugar it will produce the chemicals it needs to deal with that large amount of sugar and expects you to do something with it now here's the scenario you need more energy you get an energy drink you drink the energy drink and your body says all right let's do something with this and you say all right I'm gonna sit down and study <laughs> so your body says huh hmm, this is not exactly what I had in mind I was expecting some exertion some activity where we're immediately gonna work off some of the sugar after all I just made all this energy available but you're not using it well it turns out that if you do this a lot if you drink energy drinks a lot and rapidly elevate your sugar intake using energy drinks then it is possible that your body becomes accustomed to that and says fool me once shame on you <laughs> fool me twice shame on me one of those things is you know the sugar is simply not going to react or make the body react the way it's supposed to and that actually is a form of diabetes this, of course, is now known. It works with a, a variety of other kinds of things. Um, increased intake of sweets of any kind may lead to this. But in some people, the use of energy drinks is particularly strong when it comes to that. And so one of the things you might want to do, depending on how your body reacts to energy drinks, you might want to choose something that doesn't quite work the same way. And instead of using as much sugar, you work with B vitamins. There are other kinds of problems when you give yourself a sugar high because after a sugar high you end up getting a sugar low which is why most coaches will not allow their, their team to consume energy drinks before practice. You may need to take it afterwards to recover but not before because if you start your practice and you're in the middle of, of it and all of a sudden you crash because you don't have enough energy anymore then what good's the practice, right? And so there are some real things to uh, be concerned with. The other thing that is interesting, and it's an abuse of the system, not only the energy drink system, but also your own body, is if you add alcohol to the energy drink. Why? Well, alcohol is something that makes you relax. The energy is something that makes you want to go. Right? And so you tell your body, I want to go, but I want to relax. <laughs> and what is your body going to do with that? So in some cases, with some individuals, and this has happened in the bar scene in Victorville, you end up people literally keeling over because their body says, you want this, you want that, I quit. And they, they need medical attention. So it's just something to be aware of. Sugar and energy is one of the most direct ways by which you can influence and upset your body. So that's just something to remember. And that's the end of the first part of this.